Ah, welcome to Scotland. Thank, Thank you, you so much, much nice for coming up to, uh, to speak to us at the Asia Scotland Institute here in the Business School of the University of Strathclyde. Uh, and you reminded us on the way here that your family comes from Scotland. Comes from Aberdeen, yes. Comes from Aberdeen. Uh, many left hundreds in of years. The 1880s, which was very exactly. interesting. Good. And so, so, in a sense, welcome back, although you're the other side of the country. Um, it's great that you've come to talk, and what I wanted to do was perhaps focus with you on the key, I think, main four points, particularly you talked about, that you will be using to speak to the audience later on today. Um, and I wonder if you could just tell me what those four key things are, and then perhaps we could focus on each of those in due course. Yes, what I'm going to talk about is some of the threats that the nation state today faces yeah. in the world. So some of the uh, traditional threats like the state-based threats, yeah. um, competition between states, which has clearly got worse in, in recent years, a little bit of a cyber threat, the terrorism threat, yeah. but focusing more on the erosion of the rules-based international order, which we thought was set up after the Second World War mm -hmm. and has been hugely beneficial to Western democracies, sure. open trading countries like our own, mm -hmm. but is now under very severe threat from a number of different uh, areas and what would happen if that uh, international order gets overthrown, what might replace it? Yeah. At a time when the traditional champion of that international order, the President of the United States, mm -hmm. doesn't himself mm -hmm. believe in it mm -hmm. and isn't really defending it, if anything, mm -hmm. he's undermining it uh, himself. And indeed, you were our permanent, permanent representative of the United Nations, and uh, had you been there at uh, the General Assembly last week, when, or week four, when he stood up and said, that you did not believe in globalization, what would your reactions have been and what are they now to that? Well, I think it's a wrong attitude. I think the international system has greatly benefited the United States as it's benefited the United Kingdom and mm -hmm. Western democracies yeah, yeah. because it was a liberal image. It was built in our image. We were the ones who designed the institutions, the legislative framework, the regulatory structures after the Second World War. And it's therefore based on democracy, human rights, and free trade. Mm -hmm. And all those things have greatly uh, increased our prosperity and reduced uh, conflict. And I think it would be very reckless now to throw that away yeah. and allow it to be replaced yeah. by perhaps a uh, more China-centric yeah. international order, which would be based on a whole different set of values. Yeah. People talk about the Thucydides trap and how a rising power threatens the one that's there already and indeed examples are given of China now threatening the United States and America. Do you see that as a, an inexorable rise with the ultimate outcome that China becomes bigger and exerts more influence than the United States? I think the, the rise is inexorable and there's no doubt that China will probably become the largest uh, economy in the world. Yeah. That doesn't necessarily mean that it will win the battle of ideas, right. um, because I think there are tensions within the China state that haven't yet played through, and how long they can continue to combine a sort of economic liberalism mm -hmm. with political repression, I think, yeah. is open to question. And I think some of those strains will come through uh, in the coming years, which could change China's approach to the to the world. Yeah. But there is no doubt that the defining relationship for the next thirty years in the world is between the United States and China and there will be both partnership and competition yeah. and possibly even conflict yeah. around a whole range of issues, whether yeah. it's Taiwan or technology or anything else. Mm. As we sit here today, of course, the big question is what is going to happen to Hong Kong? We again talked about this earlier today. Do you think that China will uh, intervene and do something at some point, and will that have an impact on how China is perceived by the rest of the world? I think yes and yes. I think there is a strong risk that China will be uh, drawn into intervention, military intervention, because yeah. I don't see the protests in Hong Kong actually ending. Yeah. And the demands that the protesters are now making, mm -hmm. admirable though they are, are not deliverable by the Hong Kong authorities yeah. or will be allowed by China. Yeah. And therefore, I think a Chinese intervention, the risk of that has gone up. Mm -hmm. That will be damaging to China's international reputation, but I don't think that will stop them mm -hmm. any more than some of the other things they've done, like sure. militarization of the South China Sea, yeah. the sort of uh, discrimination against the Uyghur Muslims in, in Western China. Yeah. Of course, those are condemned by the whole world, but nonetheless, they've gone ahead and done them. Sure. 
your 40 years in the Foreign Office uh, included quite a lot of time spent in Pakistan, in Pakistan's future and the whole question of Kashmir. You may well get asked a question about that um, later today. What do you think about the future of Pakistan under Imran Khan and, and the issue of what's going on in Kashmir now? Well, I think Imran Khan's prime ministership does offer an opportunity for Pakistan yeah. to uh, get over some of the economic difficulties that it's had, engage back into mm -hmm. the uh, to the world. But nonetheless, I think there are multiple challenges for a country like Pakistan, with the rising population, with the big divisions mm -hmm. between the centre and the provinces, the military and the civilians, the haves and the yeah. have-nots, yeah. and the fact that after nearly seventy-five years of independence only one-sixth of Pakistan's borders are formally agreed. You know, there is a psychosis of insecurity in yeah. the state, which I think is worrying. And the two potential flashpoints um, with India are water on the one hand yeah. and Kashmir on the other. Yeah. And the step that uh, Prime Minister Modi has recently taken to take away the special status of Kashmir, I think is very reckless and dangerous and could easily lead to a conflict between India and Pakistan yet again. There are so many flashpoints going on as we sit here, of course, sitting here in Glasgow, where there's a substantial Pakistani population, of course. Um, but as we speak right now, we hear of Turkey starting its military yeah. action in uh, northeast, I think, uh, Syria. Um, Turkey's role, as I guess it's got the second largest standing army in NATO, Turkey's role within NATO, a Turkey that's buying equipment from Russia, as we know. Um, are you an optimist about where all that ends, or are all diplomats paid to be realists? Well, I am realistic, but I'm also, I think, relatively optimistic about Turkey. Um, there is a plurality of politics in Turkey, mm -hmm. and yes, Turkey is a, a NATO ally, and I yeah. wouldn't expect that to change. Um, and on the fundamentals of NATO, they will be loyal uh, allies. Sure. But uh, Turkey has always been a country that bridges you know, Europe and Asia, mm -hmm. and it's not unreasonable for them to reach no. out and have a relationship with, uh, with uh, Russia and acquire weapons uh, from Russia if necessary. And of course they do have their own issue with the Kurdish population, both yeah. in Turkey but also the neighbouring countries. Yeah. I think um, Prime Minister Erdogan has taken Turkey in a wrong direction, um, it's a damaging direction, yes. but it's not an irreversible direction. And I can see a future where Turkey uh, becomes more uh, comfortable with itself yeah. um, and again uh, establishes that important bridge between Europe and Asia without disrupting the peace. Yeah. But I'm afraid the Kurds are one of those uh, ethnic groups that have suffered in history. Yes. Um, we've seen others in the, in the past. They were lost out and the one thing on which Turkey, Syria, Iraq, Iran all agree mm. is they don't want to give the Kurds greater yeah. autonomy than they yeah. have at the moment. And I think that's very unfortunate yeah. for them. Almost in conclusion, we talk about the Trump administration having lost a lot of friends and made quite a lot of enemies in the way in which it's behaved in international relations. Is the United Kingdom running the risk in the Brexit or post-Brexit environment of having lost friends in Europe and elsewhere and needing to rebuild bridges because of the way in which we've behaved? We will certainly need to build bridges, but um, leaving the European Union doesn't fundamentally change Britain's international posture, which has always been based on three bridges. Yeah. A bridge to continental Europe, a bridge to the United States, and a bridge to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. Now, when we joined the European Union, yeah. it is true that the bridge to Europe became shorter and fatter, but it was still a bridge. We yeah. were never core members. We were never founder members of the European project. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I don't think when we leave the European Union, that fundamental posture change. We will need to rebuild that bridge, which will become longer and thinner, if you like, um, at the same time as maintaining the American and the rest of the world. So um, I don't think myself that Brexit uh, necessarily means a permanent loss of standing for Britain in the world. I am a Remainer. Um, I think it's a strategic mistake, mainly for economic reasons, to, to leave the European Union. But nonetheless, there's no reason per se why Brexit should damage our international standing. But we do need to make a major effort with our key European partners, particularly France and Germany. And I'm someone who's been urging the government that there should be uh, a new iconic project 
that binds us to yeah. our key European yeah. Yeah. Uh, neighbors. Well, there was the Channel Tunnel, the Concord to project. Exactly. You know, we've had these um, iconic projects in mm -hmm. the past. We need another one that yeah. binds us to these players um, over the next 20 years. And finally, because you're being, going to be talking to a lot of come on, I'd say younger people with their careers in front of them, would you recommend a career as a diplomat to people in general? I think I would. Um, my father, I come from a long line of uh, army people, and mm -hmm. I remember my father saying to me, Mark, I've had a fantastic career in the army, but I don't recommend you join the army because um, I went all over the world and fought in the Second World War, etc., mm -hmm. um, but you would only end up in Northern Ireland or Northern Germany. Sure. Well, of course, he turned out to be completely wrong <laughs> because in the 1980s, 90s, we were involved in a lot of wars and conflicts, and well. still are. Mm -hmm. um, I think diplomacy is a little bit the same. I don't think it's the, quite the same uh, role that when I joined in 1980, but mm -hmm. nonetheless, it's still a fantastic profession, yeah. and you have the opportunity to learn different languages, to live in different countries, different cultures, get to know people, yeah. and the core role of diplomacy hasn't changed, yeah. even though the environment and the means of carrying it out yeah. have fundamentally changed. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks very much, and thanks again for being here with us. Good. Pleasure.